Good evening, every nation. How amazing that we are gathered as one united family for our first ever online conference. Come on, every nation, Southern Africa. This is history, but not just that, it's far more. This is history that will echo into eternity. Why don't you take a moment and tell that to someone in the room. Tell them that this is history that will echo into eternity. My name is Pierre and it's my absolute joy to be your host for this first evening of Rebuild. On behalf of the ENSA leadership team, welcome. This moment has been birthed out of devotion, saturated in prayer, and we are believing God for a supernatural time of meeting with Him. Now earlier this month, we would have had come together in Johannesburg for our Build conference. But seeing that the world, and I believe more so, God had other plans, we decided to rethink our Bolt Conference, revisit the regional plans, and here we are for the first ever Rebuild Conference in the world as an Every Nation family. I'm grateful for leaders who don't only continue to steward and lead us well during this time, but leaders who continue to pioneer, continue to take new ground. This weekend experience quickly turned into such a moment of pioneering. And we have faith that it will be a time to be refreshed, repurposed and released as individuals, as families and as churches. Over the next few days, we will be hearing from leaders across the world. Our lineup includes messages from South Africa, Mauritius, Namibia and the US, although one of the speakers might prefer being called as one from the Philippines just to give you a little hint there of, of who's in our lineup. But tomorrow you'll be hearing from Pastor Steve as well. I believe the messages that these men and women recorded will have great impact in all of our lives, our churches, and especially our nations. Each conference session will include two speakers, worship from various worship teams and worship leaders, and a few additional family moments. To truly get the most out of your conference experience, Make a commitment right now in this moment at the beginning to show up and get online and be part of this journey for the next two days together as a family. My family and I love to go for hikes in nature or new cities and as much as we can and, and I'm quite a steady uh, walker. I walk quite fast and usually I get to, to run ahead a little bit. It's just the nature of how I walk and, and the two girls fall behind. And um, I, every so often I'm getting called back to walk with them. But the challenge with walking ahead is that at certain points in our journey, I see things before them. And at the same time, they see things that I might have missed in my walking ahead. And it's when we as a family realize that it's much better to stick together through the entire walking experience, then we really get to benefit out of it fully. We get to enjoy all the surprises together, the wonder, the joy of being together at the same time, seeing the same things, celebrating the same moments. And that's really my invitation to us at the start of this conference, that we will walk through this together as a family through these next three sessions, as individuals and as a united church. Let's be on this journey together because I believe there will be moments where all of us will be standing in unity in awe of what Jesus is doing in our midst. Even though we are not physically together, I have faith that because of God's spirit and because God is spirit and He is outside time and space, that we will have a united encounter as one church. 
as we stick together on this journey. He promises in His Word that well-known scripture, Psalm 133, Behold how good and how pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. Over the next two days, let's not only dwell in our homes, let's not only dwell in Him, but let's dwell together in unity through this time. And believe me, I know that there's a promise ahead as we dwell together in unity of what He wants to do for us as a region. We are in for a time of blessing. And as that psalm continues, we are in for a time of being refreshed by His anointing. Our theme this evening is refresh. Let's take a moment to pray together, to devote ourselves and ask God for a refreshing touch tonight as this conference starts. Jesus, we come with ready and hungry hearts. We pray that you would lead us through the next two days in a beautiful way. We pray, Lord, that as we come to drink from the wellspring of life, that with inside each and one of us, Lord, there would be a wellspring of life just bubbling over, Lord. I pray for my friends who might feel dry at this particular point, Lord, that you would come and refresh them. I pray for those of us, Lord, who might feel like we're living in overflow, Lord, that more of that would come to us over the next two days, Lord. And I pray that by your Spirit, we would leave our time together tonight being refreshed because we have had an encounter with you. We steady our hearts, we put our gaze on you, and we invite you and ask you to lead us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm going to hand over to the Every Nation Cape Town in One City team as they're going to lead us in a couple of songs of praise to start off this evening.
Yes, Lord, at the start of this conference, we want to just say, Lord, that this is exactly what we desire to do, to make room for you to work. Lord, we make room for you to speak. We make room, Lord, for your wonder in our midst. So we ask, Lord, that as our hearts open up and our, how our spaces open up to you, that you would come and inhabit every part of of our lives over the next few days, Lord. There's so many things, Lord, that, that takes our attention, Lord, that demands our attention, Lord. So many things in life that we have got to make 
room too. But I pray, Lord, that every time we need, meet over the next few days, Lord, that we would make room for you. That for a moment, Lord, we would just put aside all those other things and just say, Lord, will you come and increase? And we choose to decrease. I pray, Lord, that your voice would increase in speaking to us, Lord, that all the voices around us, just for a moment in time, Lord, will decrease. And Lord, as we go into your word tonight, may your voice be the voice that we, your sheep here, may we know the shepherd's voice tonight. And may that be the voice that we choose to follow as we make room for you. Thank you, Jesus. I want to encourage you over the next two days to continue making room for God to move in your midst, to make the appropriate room, to find that space where you can comfortably connect with Him as you listen in and as you join in with our sessions. I'm ready to take us into our first speaker session tonight, and it is my joy to introduce our first speaker, Pastor Christopher Chapeo, all the way from Namibia. Pastor Christopher serves as the senior pastor of Every Nation Vintuk, and he's married to Melody, and together they have three boys. Not only are they passionate about Jesus, family, and their local church, but they are deeply passionate about the kingdom of God advancing through all spheres of society. And I know that the word that he has for us is going to be impactful. So let's make room for the word of God as Pastor Chris leads us in, in a message. Thank you, Pastor Chris. Over to you. Hello, Every Nation family. What an awesome time we've had just launching this conference and a time of worship and beginning once again in the presence of the Lord. And I'd like to welcome you to this first session of the Rebuild Conference all the way from Vintuk, Namibia. And I bring you warm greetings from your spiritual family here in the congregations in Namibia. A big thank you to the regional leadership team for giving us the privilege to share the word and encourage you in this time. And also for the Cape Town leadership team for organizing all of this and for putting things together. We really pray for you and we're thankful for this time. And today our theme is Refresh. We're starting with the theme of Refresh. And I'm going to speak to us about how to rebuild your personal destiny after failure or loss. And uh, it's been a difficult time that many of us have been going through. And the Lord has been constant and the same and faithful. And so these words I pray they will encourage you so on that note let's just start with a word of prayer father in the name of jesus i thank you god that your word does not return void that your promises are true and that today father you're here to rebuild and to refresh the lives of your sons and daughters i thank you for a word in season i thank you lord that you will touch lives in the name of jesus for your glory we pray Amen. Amen. You know, we've been going through a difficult time over the past few months all over the world, and particularly in South Africa and Namibia, we have also been touched, everything relating to COVID-19 and all the different aftermaths that come with that. And uh, for many people, they've been shaken to the core of their existence and their identity because of the struggles that they faced. And there's a quote that I wanted to launch off with by Mark Lawrence that says, it is the irony of our time that men who seek peace must make war. And we recognize today, even as governments have declared war on an invisible enemy, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 says, our war and our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and rulers. So we are in a state where we are trying to gain more and more of the territory that Jesus Christ has won for us. And we're engaged in this battle to make sure that we retain and build upon everything that God has given us. And Today, I'd, I'd just like to share with us from the life of David. So if you've got your Bible, let's go right now to the book of Acts, chapter 13, verse 22. And this is the testimony in the New Testament about David. 
It says, and when he had removed him, which is Saul, he raised him up. He raised up David to be their king, to whom also he gave their testimony and said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. And we see here the testimony of God concerning his servant David. In the Old Testament, we're going to go now into the scriptures to see a couple of areas of David's life where he was in a state of war and where he experienced loss and failure and where he suffered certain things and how he managed to recover from that. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 30. And I'm reading here concerning the account where David was running away from King Saul, who was pursuing him because of the jealousy in King Saul's heart. And uh, we read just now in the book of Acts about how God rejected Saul and raised up David, who was a man after God's heart. And at that time, David decided to run away and flee and hide among the land of the Philistines. And just in the chapter before the one we're going to read, he was going to do battle against King Saul as part of the Philistine army. And so the Philistine rulers say, no, we don't want David to be part of the battle because he might turn against us. And so he gets sent back by the Philistine rulers. And uh, him and his army are on the way back now. And this is what they find in verse 30, in, in chapter 30, it says, David and his men reached Ziglag on the third day. And now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Ziglag. They had attacked Ziglag and burned it and had taken captive the woman and everyone else in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. And when David and his men reached Ziglag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. And verse 4 says, So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. And it says in verse 5, David and his two wives, David's two wives were taken away as well. And verse 6 says, David was greatly distressed because the men were talking about stoning him. These were his mighty men that were willing to flee from King Saul and be with David in the wilderness. They were at the point of distress to the point where they were willing to turn on him. It says each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord his God. And then David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. Abiathar brought it to him and David inquired of the Lord. He asked the Lord, shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? And the word of the Lord came to him saying, pursue them, he answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. So David comes to a situation where he's lost everything that he holds dear. He's lost even his family. And his men around him are starting to turn, turn against him. And we see here a couple of uh, uh, principles that David took in order to recover from that place. The first thing that he did is he definitely didn't hold back from expressing his grief. It says they wept aloud until they had no strength to weep and they were distressed. And then in verse six, it says, but David found strength in the Lord. And then he goes and he calls for the priest who will give him the word of the Lord. And in this time, you might be in a situation where you've experienced loss, where you've encountered a job loss or a family member that has been a casualty of COVID-19. Whatever the issue might be, we're in a time where the word of God is still true and is still constant and is still able to give us courage in the time of war. So David had experienced loss in a time of war. David also experienced failure in a time of war. We're looking here at 2 Samuel verse, chapter 11 from verse 1. It says, in, in the spring of the year, the time when kings go out 
to war, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David stayed at home. David stayed at home. So he sends off his army in the time of war. He stays at home. In verse 4 it says, so David, David noticed this woman bathing while he was on the roof. And, and in verse 4 it says, so David sent messengers and took her and she came to him and he lay with her. And then she went back home. And what is interesting about this part is that David is a man after God's own heart. This is what God thinks about him. This is his identity. And yet he's in a place, one, where he's experienced loss. And secondly, where he's experiencing failure. So he calls this woman and she comes to his home. And then he basically takes advantage of her. And the story goes on to tell us about how this woman gets home and after some time she returns word to David saying that I'm pregnant. And David now begins to engage in a series of attempts to try and repair this experience that he has undergone. So the first principle that I want to share with us today is that when we fail and when we lose, we tend to forget who we are. We tend to forget who we are. And in the story when David, when David heard that he had impregnated Bathsheba, he knows that she is actually the wife of one of his mighty men who is at battle. And so what he does is he calls for Uriah, who is Bathsheba's husband, to come home. And when he gets home, Uriah is probably asking, okay, Dave, why, why did you call me back? You know, we're, we're on the front. And so he calls Uriah back and he begins to try and attempt to get Uriah to go back home, sleep with his wife, cover up this adulterous act in order for David to escape his consequences. But Uriah says to him, look, we don't do this. No one sleeps with their wives or sleeps in their homes while the tabernacle or the ark is out there and the army is out there. Long story short is that David actually reaches out and leads to the death of his mighty man, his friend. So we need to realize that when we're going through times of difficulty and trial, we must remember who we are or we might be tempted to do things that are completely out of character from God's heart for us. Number two, God always gives us a word of repentance or restoration. In 1 Samuel 30, it says, David inquired of the Lord and God spoke to him and he managed to actually recover everything that he had lost. And in 2 Samuel 12, Nathan the prophet comes to him and says, you are the man who did this and the word of the Lord leads David to repentance. So God's word always comes to us even in our difficult and dark times in order to give us a word of encouragement and a word of direction out of our trouble. Acts, to, uh, Acts chapter 3 verse 19 says, Repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And there is no refreshing that comes into our lives without that place of repentance. And then lastly, number three, in times of loss and failure, we can rise up and worship God. What happened with David when, when the enemy took away his family, he went to the presence of the Lord and encouraged himself in the Lord. What happened with David in the time after he, he had the, 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 the pregnancy with Bathsheba and the child died, the Bible says that he, he, he stood up, he washed his face, he went into the temple, and he worshipped the Lord in the middle of his trial, in the middle of his loss, in the middle of his failure. He always sought and worshipped God. And I want to tell you today that despite everything that you might have gone through, whatever failures you might have experienced, whatever loss you might have experienced, I want to prophesy to somebody today that David fulfilled his destiny, despite all of that, and so will you. I believe that God is speaking to us today to say, hang in there. The word of the Lord concerning your life has not been
been blotted out, it will surely come to pass. And we read in the book of Revelation how the elders say, don't weep because the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. But even in the end, God was willing to refer to his son as the root of David, that he begins to harvest from our lives all the goodness that he has planted into it. And so in conclusion, Romans 8 verse 28 says, And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And even in this time, I want to encourage those who have gone through loss, who have gone through a sense of failure. You might have lost your livelihood. You might have lost whatever, whatever it is that God has play, had placed in your hands. But I'm here to encourage us today that the word of the Lord concerning your life will surely come to pass. Enter into the presence of the Lord. Be in that place of refreshing. And even throughout this conference, many speakers will come and share with us the rhema and the timely word that we need to hear. Have your ears open to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to you in this season. And that God will encourage you in your inner man, that you will be encouraged in your spirit to overcome whatever trial you might be facing. And so I just speak that grace over your people, Father. I thank you, Lord, that wherever they may be sitting, wherever they may be, Lord, that your eye is upon them, Father God. And you see, you see the suffering, you see the loss, you see the pain, you see the failure of your people. And Father, I thank you that you are drawing them into a place of great courage, that you are drawing them into a place of worship and into a place of surrender, Lord. And Father, that your word concerning them will surely come to pass. And I thank you for that and I bless your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't want to go back, Lord, to the way I used to be, the way I used to be. I won't go back, Lord, to the way I used to be, before you rescued me. stop till every drop in nation bows before you and I will not stop till they all see your glory see your glory your fire Father, I thank you today for the fire of God that burns within us. Your zeal that 
burns brighter and brighter. I ask you to refresh the fire for fresh fire. Lord, we thank you that as we open your word today, that you would refresh us, that you would strengthen us, that you would challenge us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. As the band continues to minister, I'm going to take a moment just to be in the Word of God. And I want to draw your attention to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. And following on from Pastor Chris' message on lessons from the life of David, I want us to sp- spend some time just studying this chapter, this verse, and draw some parallels for us from there. Would you read with me in 2 Chronicles 7, verse 13, and it says, When I shut up the heavens so, there is no, so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land and send plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Verse 15 says, Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. As every nation worldwide, we have joined the initiative called Unite 714. It's a prayer initiative that has joined the body of Christ in prayer together during this time of COVID-19 pandemic. That Unit Unit uh, 714 is taken from 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14. The backdrop of the scripture starts with David, Solomon's dad, who had its desire to see the presence of God come back into Israel, the Ark of the Covenant come back to Israel. And to build a dwelling place for this temple, for this, for this ark, for his presence to reside in. What's amazing, even though David had so much success, so much things that he achieved, every mission that he took out, took on, succeeded just about. Wealth and fame was his portion. Yet he was not content to rest in that. He was not content for this very reason that the presence of God was not in Israel. The Ark of the Covenant was not with them. I know of some people who will be content with having God's blessing, but would never miss God if He's not there. They're happy to receive success and wealth and fame and families and all these great things that God blesses us with and He wants us to have. But above all, it's His presence that matters the most. And we're not talking about the omnipresence of God, which means God being everywhere. We're talking about the manifest, the abiding presence of God. The presence, the place where He resides, the dwelling place. It is relational. It is interactive. It's God interacting with us and us with Him. It is not just knowing about God or worshiping from afar. It's walking with God. And He manifests His presence with us. He shows up when we pray. He shows up when we open the Word. He shows up when we worship. God wants to refresh our passion for Him, first and foremost. But because David was a man of war, God did not permit him to build the temple. However, David was successful in passing on the mission, this mission to bring the presence of God back into Israel, into Israel, to his son Solomon. And Solomon built this spectacular temple. You know, Solomon built a spectacular temple not because it was an instruction, but he caught the heart of his father to give to God what is duly his, to invoke the presence of God. This temple was so spectacular, just the gold and silver overlays was worth over $200 billion uh, in today's value. It was quite a temple. 
And even though Solomon built this magnificent temple, it was still void of the presence of God until the worship came, until the devotion came, until the prayers came. We can have all the amazing structures, all the amazing plans, all the amazing uh, 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 strategic plans. All these things can be amazing. Great children's ministry, great youth ministry, great church uh, buildings. But if the presence of God is not there, we just have a beautiful building, a beautiful structure. It's the presence of God, the manifest presence of God that brings life. But I want us to to think about what David did, we must succeed in passing on the heart of our mission, our mission to have a passion for God and to have a passion for His mission for us to the next generation. In order to pass it on, we have to have it ourselves. The passion, the mission is to see worship and consequent presence of God in every nation in our generation on every campus that the next generation will own this passion not only do we want to see this passion being owned by them but they must do better than we would have able be able to do they must have be motivated they must devote they must be more passionate they must be smarter they must be more powerful more more humble our next generation is getting more powerful than we are and i pray for that we pray that you would carry the passion of god for this mission mission for his presence mission to see his worship in every nation that's what we're about we exist to love and honor god by establishing Christ-centered, spirit-empowered, social responsibility, discipleship-making churches and campus ministries. That's what we're passionate about. That's our mission that God has given us. With the inauguration of Solomon's temple, Solomon brought a significant amount of sacrifices, unprecedented worship. Instruments was designed just for this moment. The worship of singers, the Levites, came before God. And it's in the context of extravagant worship that God manifests Himself. The glory of God filled the temple, Scripture says, even to the place where the Levites couldn't do their priestly duties. I desire for those moments. Sometimes I have them, sometimes I don't. But what I know is that the presence of God is more than a moment. The presence of God is more than a feeling, a sensation, a fall-down moment. The presence of God is a relationship with God Himself. It's not just about a spiritual force. It's a person. It's not just a moment, but it's in being entwined with God, living in Him and through Him, having our being in Him, being in intimate relationship with God. And my prayer is that you'll be refreshed in your relationship with God, in your passion for Him. It's in this context that God answers Solomon's prayer, which you can find in, in chapter 6, verse 27, when he says, When the heavens are shut up and there is no rain because your people have sinned against you, and when they pray toward this, uh, this place and give praise to your name, and turn from this sin because you have afflicted them. He answers Solomon's prayer in the context of worship. It says, when I shut up the heavens so there's no rain, or command locusts to devour the land and send a plague among them, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Loved ones, it's not just about turning away from wickedness, but it starts by turning to God. It starts with worship. It starts with crying out to Him. And when you're able to cry to God, He empowers you to turn away from wickedness. He gives you the strength by His Holy Spirit. Because of your relationship with Him, He gives you the passion to turn away from wickedness. 
this is truly a word in season. Many people want us to pray for coronavirus and the effects, and we do. But the real prayer we should be praying is this prayer. If my people, God, says, who was called by my name, will humble themselves. We know that God loves us. He proved it to us. But the question is, do we love God? Don't get offended when I ask this question. Peter got really offended when Jesus asked him the question, do you really love me? We'd like to think we do. But the love of God that we have in our hearts is not just expressing a beautiful song or beautiful prayers. The love of God means as disciples that we are in a living relationship with Jesus Christ, walking in the freedom of the cross and in obedience to our Lord's commission through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what the love of God means. It's more than a song. It's more than a prayer. It's a life devoted to Him. If you want to be refreshed in your passion for God and your passion for His mission, it starts with this prayer. The band will lead us in some prayer and some worship again, and we're going to pray shortly into that. We're going to have moments where we're going to pray this scripture together. And then we're going to go in a moment of just continue to minister and allow the Holy Spirit to renew and refresh our passion for God and for His mission. Thank you, Ben.
if you would stand with me where you are if you can I want to lead you into a series of prayers as a way of ministering and as Solomon dedicated the temple we are going to dedicate this temple our temple and we're going to trust that the Holy Spirit will baptize us afresh will refresh us And that God will manifest himself in our lives in a greater way. I'm going to lead you into a simple prayer. And really, I ask you to make this your prayer. Every nation in Southern Africa, we are sold out to God. Let's pray. Father, we are your people. We are called by your name. We turn to you and humble ourselves and we pray and seek your face. And we turn from any wicked way, from every wicked way, every idol, everything that has taken your place in our lives. Father, would you hear from heaven and forgive our sins and heal our land we cry out to you even as Solomon cried out to you for your presence for your abiding manifest presence for a relationship with you that goes to the next level I ask it in the name of Jesus second prayer I'd like to pray is for God to refresh our passion for the mission for his mission let's pray Father thank you for sending your son so that the nations can know what it means to be forgiven and be united with their maker your mission and commission for us to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations we take seriously and we ask you to refresh our passion for that mission today. We ask you to stir up in us that fire for the nations, that fire for the lost, that heart of compassion for for those who do not know you. Lord, do not leave us in a selfish state. Lord, for those of us who has gone over the years and have lost that fire, rekindle that fire for our churches who have made other things the main thing make this the main thing again I pray restore the mission to your church I pray to us your people in Jesus name the last prayer I want to pray is for passion to pass on this mission to the next generation to pass on this desire for God to the next generation you see it's not through a structure that will be able to pass it on it's not through through some fancy thing we put together not even through preaching the way we pass on this mission 
is through discipleship. Life on life discipleship. Relational discipleship. And young people, we do believe in you. I, I think I reflect the hearts of every, every senior pastor. We do believe in you. We really believe you're going to be greater. But it starts with seeking God, seeking His face. I want to pray that we would have a a security in our hearts as leaders, as fathers and mothers, to pass on this mission, to get out of the way we need to get out of the way, to let them run, to recontextualize this vision and mission in your generation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the joy of having a, a David and a Solomon relationship for the joy of having sons and daughters, disciples, people that we love, that we are able to pass on this mission and the passion for God and the passion for the mission because you have ruined us forever to anything else. I pray that every one of this generation will be activated to love you and to fulfill your purposes on the earth. Lord, they're going to do better than we have. They're going to be greater and contextualizing. And we're going to see a greater harvest as we celebrate the day of Pentecost tomorrow. It was during a time of harvest that the Pentecost was held and the Spirit of God came upon your disciples in the room. And a harvest of 3,000 people was harvested that day. We pray for that to be the case. That, Lord, God, there will be 3,000 of people being harvested in this time of Pentecost. That as you pour out your Spirit, that we would experience the, the fire of God to see a harvest coming. And this generation will see it time and time again. That the nations of the earth will know that you are God. That you can receive the reward of your suffering, praises and worship from every nation because of this generation that will take this forward. We pray that in the name of Jesus, stir up that passion in our hearts. Refresh us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I trust that as we go into one more song that you, God, will really do that in your life afresh. Thank you, Ben. Your praises live in every word.
Oh Lord, how great you are. What a way to end such an incredible time together tonight. I don't know about you, but for a moment there, I was imagining all of us in our homes and how thousands of hallelujahs were directed to God just a moment back. Thank you, Pastor Gillian. Thank you to the Every Nation in One City team. Thank you, Pastor Christopher, for a great start to this conference time. And I want to remind you that we will do the same again tomorrow. We will have a great time together with the Every Nation Rosebank team. Pastor Steve Murrell will be speaking to us, as well as Roshni from Mauritius. So don't miss out. Go to bed, have a good night's rest, and we'll see you in the morning.